from with my thing. All right. <clears throat> Access to this webinar is for educational and informational purposes only. Consult a licensed broker, registered investment advisor, before placing any trades. All securities and orders discussed in the draft. I monitor virtual trading, capital virtual hemp prices, and returns may differ from natural trading. Results, commission costs are excluded. Me, the PhilStarport.com, PSW, no affiliates, many of the various active offices, personnel, representatives, agents, or independent contractors. Our such capacity is licensed by financial advisors, registered investment advisors, registered broker dealers. Nothing can end the webinar website, promotional material, cost of promotion, recommendation, solicitation, or offer of any particular investment, security, or transaction. Trading options involves risk. Visit the OCC website to be doing really real options, including our country, the characters from this, standardized options. PSW provides education and training services that are meant to teach your risk and such rewards of trading options. We are not a service that tells you where to trade. We are not implying guaranteeing any profit. As always, do not trade money, can't afford to lose. Past performance is not equal future results. And results of this webinar are not typical and are only valid on this as specific for identified date. Your results may vary by access to the webinar. You agree to hold the above harmless for any losses you may incur. If you the information discussed in the media identified above, by access to the webinar, you agree to be placed on a mailing list and receive our newsletter. Rest assured we take your privacy very seriously and we will not distribute a set of your information to anyone. Okay, time to pass that. Now, what's next? <laughs> you can see I'm not in the mood today. All right, so let's see. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Where are we? Oh, yeah, let's take a look at the market. That's a good, wait, good place to start. GE, why is GE up there? Look at poor GE getting back to eight, though. That should be YM. <laughs> All right, so there's only a three day chart. So pretty sad. I mean, yes, yesterday morning, or oh, well, yesterday morning we were up here, and now we're here, so we're catching. Uh, no, well, not the Dow. The Dow's not really getting 50% of its bounds. So if you if you look at 25,000, let's say we fell from there, and we come down to 24,350, that's 650 points. So 650 points, 5% rule, 20% of the drop is your first retrace as a weak bounce. So 650 would be uh, 130 would be your balances. Right? Yes, 130 point bounces. So we'd be looking at, why does that seem wrong? No, that's right. So 130 point bounces. And that would take us to uh, 650. I'm sorry, 350 would be 100. Let's call it 150 point bounces. So we'd look at um, 245 and 24650. So right here is exactly the strong bounce off of yesterday's drop. That's what you do with the five percent rule. It's you really want to work it up. The problem with the, the thing you have to get used to though is it's not like math. You, you could do it spike to spike and do it exact. It still works. But the reality is that this is just futures bullshit. It doesn't matter. We fell from consolidation zone around. Like, when you see a consolidation zone around a big whole number line, that's much more important than anything else. So then you take the twenty five thousand line to start. So this is the art part of the 5% rule. You have to make a, a logical determination and say, look, this, this is just an arbitrary number at an arbitrary time. It doesn't mean anything. What matters is we consolidated it on the 25,000 line and then failed it. And how did we fail it? We failed it this far to this consolidation at 24.3. And so I'm saying, it's, and since, since the low is 350, I'm saying, okay, let's call it 650. And then you want to say, okay, if it was 650, then 20% of 650 is 130. So now we add 130 back to this number. And, and since obviously the Dow moves in like 50 point increments and 100 point increments, I say, at that point, I'm like, okay, call it 150. And don't forget, it's not important that you hit the number on the nose. The point is that we know that around, you expect to see resistance at around 150 points high, which is a 24.5 line. And you're going to see resistance there anyway, simply because it's a 24-5 line. And look what happened. This is what the 5% rule tells At this spot, the 5% rule tells you to watch this line because it's a weak bounce. We got to the weak bounce very quickly, then have trouble with the weak bounce line, but generally stay over it, which is a bullish indicator. Then we hold the weak bounce on a little trip up and down. And now, all we've done today is move up from the weak bounce line to the strong bounce line, which is another 150 points up at 24,650. For the purposes of our trading, what we really care about is if we hold 24,650, that's a strong bounce one day after a fall. 
that means generally it's it's not bullish because obviously we're we're in a much bigger fall than that in the longer picture. But on a, on a day to day basis, it's it's what you call a recovery. In the same amount of time that we fell, we are recovering at least to a strong bounce. That means we're not necessarily getting weaker. Had we failed a weak bounce today, that would have been a very bad sign of weakness. And if we fail a strong bounce today, it's a sign of weakness. Anything less than a strong bounce, the next day or the next period or whatever period you're looking at, um, you know, so if you're looking down, you look for the next period down. So if I'm looking at the two-day drop, then I know that, so in other words, okay, the two-day drop, so here we go from 25.5, to, mm, I would call it from 25.5 to, I wouldn't even give it this, I'd call it 24.5, where you see where you're consolidating. You see, you see how I'm ignoring the move above 25.5, actually didn't really know much over 25.5, but I don't care about the, the, the zigzags here, so why would I care about the zigzags here? I'm looking at the big number, 25.5 to 24.5 is the thousand point drop. Well, obviously then, 200 point bounces, right? So the real weak bounce, this is only this is only the overshoot and the recovery. But the and, and how much would an overshoot be? An overshoot would be 200 points down. So 24.3 is an overshoot of a thousand point drop. But 24.5 is the real drop because see how we held it up here? I'm gonna try to make that line. You see how we held 24.5 really well here. And here we're consolidating on it, and here we're consolidating below it. That's a good consolidation line. So ignore this. This is just noise. And don't forget on a one-day chart, it's going to look like a little spiky thing sticking out of a candle. You know, it's not going to mean anything. Um, so then the next move up is 200. So 24-7. And, and look, see how 24-7 is in play right here. On the way down, 24-7 was in play. On the way up. So that confirms what we're thinking. I was thinking 25-5, and this kind of proves it because if that if 25-5 is the line we're bouncing off, then 24-7 should be significant. And here it is, obviously significant. Obviously significant. And then 24-9 should be significant. What's going to happen here? Here's what happened in 24.9. See? See this consolidation zone here? As you're failing, what is actually the strong bounce back from this? Anyway, so now in two days, because now we're looking at a two-day drop that took us to 25, 24.3, we need a two-day recovery that takes us back to 25.9. So as of Monday, if we're not back at 24, at, at, sorry, 24, 24, 9. If we're not back at 24, 9 by Monday, to, well, because of the holiday, it's messed up. I mean, I'm not counting Friday, obviously, it's a half day. But by Monday, we got to be at 24, 9 or, or definitely over 24, 7. Otherwise, we're just, we're just basically consolidating for a big move down. And that's how you use the 5% rule, because it keeps you, it, it keeps things in perspective that you look at something and say, well, you know, okay, we're up, our, we're up 190 points, but we were, you know, we were below here. This is, this is nothing. On a thousand point drop, we're up 190 points. That's, you, that's a strong bounce, right? I'm sorry, it's not even a strong bounce, it's a weak bounce. When you said, you can always eyeball it and say, look, we're down more than a thousand points. That means we have to have a 200 point weak bounce. So we're at up to, 200, that's a weak bounce. That's nothing to get excited about. And then when you start thinking about it and you look at your consolidation lines, you realize that the, that the whole fall below 24.5 yesterday was silly. Hang on. Oh, this, this whole fall yesterday from 24.5 was, was, was a bit silly. It was overdone in the panic, which is why we flipped bullish with our, um, with our short put. I mean, with our, with our short, short term portfolio, we flipped bullish. But now we've got to take into account, you know, we're really right barely at the spot where I'm comfortable not being, not adding that hedge over the weekend. And we'll talk about that hedge also. We have a new hedge on um, SQQ. And I'm just, I'm iffy. And since I'm iffy, I think I'd rather be, I think I'd rather err on the side of caution with a, with a holiday weekend. So I think what we are going to do is add back in the short-term portfolio the new SQQ play, and we'll get back to that in a minute, see if anybody has a question. Nobody has a question. Fantastic. 
not too many of you today, actually. That's the thing. <laughs> oh, there's still 50 people. That's pretty good. I, I thought there'd be a lot less. Uh, you know, sorry, the day before the holiday. I didn't think anybody show up. Um, okay, so there's 50 people on at the moment. And nobody has nothing to say, apparently, so I'll just keep rambling on. All right. I got to ramble on. Do, 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 do. Very rock and roll right now because of that Queen movie. I really liked it. Just remind me how much I love rock and roll. Um, let's see. Is anything exciting going on? No, no, no. Weak bounce, weak bounce, strong bounce. Okay, that's the difference of strong bounce. Strong bounce, 1540. 14, call it 14. Hmm. Okay, now, see, I don't, well, you got kind of consolidation here. So let's call it this line, 1467. I don't like that. But let's see if the number makes sense. Now we have to bring out Mr. Calculator. There he is. Okay. So. Uh, one five four oh minus one four six five is seventy five divided by fifteen forty is four point eight. What do you know? That's the right number. Okay, so if we go fifteen forty, then one five four oh times point ninety five, then we know what the line really is. It's fourteen sixty three. <gasps> Look at that. <laughs> You gotta love the five percent rule. I mean, that's just that's just funny, right? <laughs> that that happens to be the five percent line right there. That exact spot is the five percent line. Um, and, and and for those of you who don't know, I hate to go over the story. I I, I hate saying the same thing again, but I obviously a lot of people never heard it, but. My dad was a, a big systems analyst. He wrote the entire. He wrote. Um, the National Computer Systems. This is back in like the 60s and 70s. He wrote the National Computer Systems for Project Head Start, for CETA, for the, uh, for the Department of Aging in the United States. Um, he, he wrote those systems, the whole freaking thing, and back in the mainframe days. And, um, and, we, and, and then he moved into uh, consulting at a consulting company. And, uh, we, we, and I would come in with him in the 80s to sit down with the bankers because I spoke banker and, and he, he and his guys didn't really speak banker. And I used to consult on all these jobs for the investment houses when they were writing their first trading programs back in the 80s and try and get computers to, you know, look at the trading. And sitting down with all, you know, everybody, I mean, J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, all the big guys would call people, call people in to do these computers. And we weren't the only ones being called in. We didn't always get the projects. But the point was that in the design phase of these things, I began to realize that um, there's a certain, um, uh, what do you call it, con, con, convolution now? Convergence, that's the word, convergence. There's a certain convergence because For the programmer, he's being told the parameters of the trade, what they're looking for and what they want to see and what they want to execute. But the programmer doesn't really understand the trading and the traders don't really understand the programming. So a lot of stuff gets fudged in the translation. Also, something a lot of people aren't aware of is there's no such thing as an actual random number. Random numbers are generated by computers and are therefore not actually random. They are part of a program that generates a random number, but that program follows specific rules. So you think things are random and you think things are, are a certain way, but they're not. Um, anyway, so what would happen is they'd have a meeting. Goldman Sachs has a meeting and they spec out uh, the parameters of how they want the program to respond to a certain situation. But the people who are doing this are, are people, and they think in terms of whole numbers and rounding things off and so on and so forth. So they'll say, whenever there's a 5% move, whenever there's a 10% move, whenever there's a 2.5% move, nobody expects out a program saying when there's a 3% move, do this. It's not human nature. And you look stupid 
putting it in the report and you spend way more time explaining it to everybody if you do it and you have to justify why you're saying 3%. So the bottom line is people don't do that. They say 5%, 7, you know, 5%, 2.5%. It comes up over and over and over again in specs. You keep seeing 5%, 10%, 2.5%. That's the numbers people keep working on. Plus, because computers round things off at a certain point, something's always rounded off, things get rounded off to whole numbers. Humans react to whole numbers. Uh, trend lines converge at whole numbers. And all these programs fighting against each other that are all being programmed by people who have a tendency to round things off and use 5% increments and key on whole numbers, all that leads to convergences on these, what I call 5% lines. And that's what the rule is. The rule is simply my recognition back in the 80s that this was happening. And working with my dad, I watched it and I said, I said, everybody thinks they're designing this unique program, you know, because they are technically, they're writing a program that's customized to their place, but they're all doing the same thing. They may have a different uh, point that they key off. They may have a different set of rules, but their rules are still five, 10, 20, do this at five, do this at 20, do this at two and a half percent. Everyone's got the same rules. And that, and because, and because everybody's program has, has generally the same kind of rules, they all end up hitting the same points. And if somebody's buying or somebody's selling, they're still gonna start triggering at the same general points. And then they start reinforcing themselves. So the more the computers trade against each other, the more the 5% rule comes into play. And, and we have what's now an 80 plus percent bot driven market, which is why I can, I can consistently nail the moves. I know what's gonna happen. And I don't, you know, I know what's going to happen within the range. If it's going to fall, it's going to fall like this. If it's going to rise, it's going to rise like this. But that lets us look ahead and say, are we in a rising pattern? And what does it mean? It means there's always going to be a bounce because at this point, here, at this 5% drop, right here, exactly at the 5% drop, um, computers start kicking in. My program start kicking in saying, because some guy has a program that says, when there's a 5% correction, we buy, we, we will buy the next 1% up. That's part of the program. They'll start buying 5% and they'll stop buying. They'll, they're like, we will start buying when there's a 5% correction and we will keep buying uh, and as long as we can get it for 4% or less. That's a normal thought a trader has. That ends up getting codified into the program and then the computer starts doing that. Meanwhile, the sell bot is being told that if it falls 5%, we're going to sell. But when it hits 5%, we're going to wait and see if there are any buyers. And that program pauses here. Then it sees if there's buyers and there are because the buy programs trigger. Then after it goes over 1%, it resumes selling to see if anyone's going to buy again at 5%. And it stops again and it goes up. Then the buy programs kick back in. And then, so what you're, what you're really seeing here is a, is a question of quantity. Are there more buy programs and sell programs? And how determined are those buy programs to buy? You're more determined to buy, you know, and again, and, the, and those are changed on the fly also. I mean, there's somebody always on the fly, like, adjusting these things. So if somebody really wants to buy, you know, the companies will have a meeting and say, okay, let, let's, let's push it up a notch and, and kick it up a notch and get more stuff. You know, so they'll put more money into their buy box. And that will then overwhelm the sell box. They'll stop functioning. The buy box start buying. It keeps going up. That triggers more buy box, blah, blah, blah. And all of this can be tracked on these 5% moves. And it's not perfect, but it's, it's a good approximation of what's going on in the market. So when you see a weak bounce, that's just a normal pause in a selling program. When you see a strong bounce, it's an indication this is more than a normal pause. More buyers are kicking in because they see what they think is recovery. Once you get over the strong bounce line, the selling is technically over. And now you're in a, a, a more of a holdy pattern where you're, where you're going to, um, you don't know that you're going to recover for sure, but just basically the wave of selling has probably ended when you achieve a strong bounce because you've broken through a technical. But the strong bounce has to hold, not just be touched. So, Basically, this is a strong bounce, but if it fails, that's not exactly a good sign. That's just showing you hit the strong bounce, it was a quick rejection, and if you come back to here, it's a really bad sign, and then if you fail the weak bounce, it's a horrible sign. 
So I hope I explained that well. Anyway, so that's, that's a short version of how the 5% rule came to be and what it is. And that's why I often say to people, it's not TA, it's just math. Because frankly, I never used a chart before. I mean, when I was from, from 1980s until 2015, I used to put, this was a spreadsheet for me. This wasn't a chart. Uh, Jean-Luc uh, started making a chart for it, um, which is super useful. You know, it's like a great tool, what we call the big chart. Um, Jean-Luc started putting the 5% rule onto a chart, and that's what we refer to these days. But the 5% rule is not at all about the chart. It's about uh, this spreadsheet that I keep down here. This is what the 5% rule used to be before he started charting. I always used to make this little spreadsheet with his boxes, and the boxes would give me a quick read on whether we're bullish or bearish. The more red boxes, the more bearish we're getting. The more green boxes, the more bullish we're getting. Very simple. The must hold lines, that's a whole other story. We'll get into that some other day. But, but it's all part of the same concept. It's all about where are the consolidation zones, where are the movements, where are the big movements, and, and I mean big movements like over decades, not like little things like this. And uh, that's where we come up with these lines. That's where we come up with these numbers. And it's amazing when you start working them, you say, oh my God, it like nails it. It's over and over again, you nail the spot where it's gonna turn. And uh, that's really useful, you know? <laughs> so it, it's a very useful way to look at the market. All right, so now maybe there's a question. Oh, more people are showing up, holy cow. Welcome all you people, look at you. Dun, 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 dun. All right, let's see. <laughs> okay, can you, CS says, can you go over your weed ETF play and if it still gets today? My weed ETF. <laughs> hey, having just come back from the cannabis convention in Las Vegas, I have got to tell you, way bigger than I thought. Way, way bigger. I was, you know, I'm an, I'm an old, because my dad was a systems analyst. We went to Comdex when it was a little couple of rooms at the Sands Hotel. Um, we were there with all, like, the biggest geeks in the country. Um, you know, I used to I used to sit down with Shelly. we talk about the business and stuff. He was like, you know, he, he was into technology, and um, he was trying to get people to come. He had trouble getting people to show up at Comdex back in the day. This is not like that at all. This cannabis ETF, there were 500 vendors there, like two floors of the convention center were full. The Las Vegas Convention Center, that big son of a bitch place, two full floors of vendors from all over the country selling machines, you know, uh, harvesting machines, growing machines, uh, different technology for dispensing. There were companies that specialize in the software to track all your stuff and do your accounting. Um, you know, it was a convention. It was a normal convention with every aspect of the business being covered with professionals. And, and everybody was in a suit. There were hardly any burnt out guys. There were hardly any people in tie-dye t-shirts or anything like that. Um, I, think at the, I think at the pop companies, there were certain guys, um, which includes Ken from my company, the one we bought, uh, who, yeah, who we dressed up for the show. <laughs> You know, we usually would be wearing a Grateful Dead t-shirt or something like that. But, um, you know, but, but by the way, Ken is, uh, he's phenomenal, man. I, I, I got to get a video of, it, of him somewhere. He is amazing. I've never seen a guy who knows a business more than Ken. He's just, he knows every single aspect of the marijuana business from top to bottom. And, you know, sitting there with him, looking at these really complex machines with like, you know, eight chambers and each one does a different thing and, and the, the chemical processes and so on and so forth. He knows the science, he knows the pressure levels, he knows the, the mixes that go in, he knows the chemicals, he knows the reactions, he knows everything about everything in this stuff. Um, it was really great and I learned so much about the business. But, I, but the point that the big takeaway from it though, this is going to be, it's not gonna be as big as tech, but it's going to be massive. It's going to be as big as food. It's going to be bigger than tobacco because it's not just because you can't use tobacco to make stuff. You can't use tobacco to heal people. You can't use tobacco in cosmetics. You can't use tobacco to make 
clothing, but you can do all this with pot. And it grows easier than tobacco and faster and better. And it's, it's the, you know, look, the reason pot's illegal is because the tobacco industry killed it back in the day. Because it's a, it's a horrifying competitor for tobacco. And tobacco is hard to grow and easy to control because it's hard to grow. Pot is not hard to grow, not easy to control, can be grown almost anywhere. Therefore, big corporations are very worried about the fact that it's it's just way too easy to grow. It's not they're not going to be able to control the pricing, they're not going to be able to control the supply, so on and so forth, like they do with tobacco. Um, I mean, yeah, yeah, I don't give a thought about it, but I mean, why is it that cigarettes are so expensive? Why can't just there be cigarette plantations all you know, tobacco plantations all over the place making cigarettes and having a big supply? Why would drive the price down so they don't allow it? It's a cartel, just like anything else. They, they control the uh, capacity and supply. You can't really do that with pot because, frankly, anybody, if you want to invest a uh, thousand bucks, let's say, I probably 500, but let's say a thousand, you want to invest a thousand bucks, you can get a kick ass indoor hydroponic thing, and you could have yourself a really nice couple of plants that will give you all the pot you could possibly consume for, you know, forever, not for a year, forever. It's just going to keep growing and keep growing and keep, and, and you just go whenever you want, take off a, a big fat butt of pot and you can smoke it and it's going to be great. Anybody can do that. So the price of pot can never really get too high because consumers can always do it themselves. You can't grow your own beer. I mean, you can technically make beer. You can make any, you can make any liquor in a bathtub, whatever you want, but it's not worth the effort, right? And And that's, that's where it is. You can't grow your own tobacco. It's too much effort. You can't do it as a regular person. The pot, boom, it's a plant. You grow it. It's a weed. <laughs> you grow it. Um, so the industry is going to be huge. Picking winners and losers, though, not easy at all, because if you want to look back in um, post-prohibition, right, in the, in the, in the uh, 40s, let's say, and you look at the liquor ads in the 40s, go, you know, find a page of uh, here. Um, Oh, here's the convention I was at. Um, so post, <laughs> you know, that's a good encryption technique. Just have your fingers offset on the keyboard and it looks like you're just typing gibberish. So <laughs> I wasn't looking, I was just typing. I was completely wrong. Post prohibition liquor. Ads. There you go. Hang on, let me get this out of the way. Images. All right. Uh, I don't know how well you guys can see this, but just to give you an idea, Pat's Blue Ribbon survived. Clark's Pure, whatever, ride did not survive. Columbia Club did not survive. Um, Country Club didn't survive. Um, God knows what that is. I can't even see it. Ten High did not survive. Um, you get the idea, right? Your car's just ride didn't survive. Ride didn't ride barely survived. Giggle Water. Oh, that's funny. Uh, Giggle Water did not survive. Coca Cola survived. Not even a liquor. Um, what's this? Oh, this is a cough remedy. Theocol. See, it wasn't. You could use liquor for something besides uh, for medicine. White Heather did not survive. Okay. So <clears throat> what I'm saying is after prohibition, you would say, oh, my God, they're legalizing liquor. And here's Mill Springs Rye, Rush Creek Bourbon. It tastes good. These guys are old time distillers. They know what they're doing, blah, blah, blah. And this stuff is great. And it's going to be a national phenomenon. All we have to do is get it out to around the country and people are going to drink it, blah, blah, blah. And what happened, right? John. Okay, keep this in mind. It is very easy to get excited about all these companies and how great it's going to be because they do what they're, they're doing something now that's in an exciting growth business. Like old Taylor 86. And and a Karaka and Tonic. Holy cow. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, that that's something we all drink, right? <laughs> so 
It's going to be the new thing. Look at our packaging. Look at our advertising. Look how professional we are. Early times. Mmm. Okay. Nine out of ten of these things died. The business died. You can have all the distributors you want. You can have the advertisers. You can have smart business people. This one made it. Oh, number seven, Sour Mesh. Now, how would you pick them out of a lineup? How would you know that's the one that's going to make it out of this whole page? All right. I want that. That's, that's the lesson here. Don't think you're a genius picking marijuana companies. I'm sure at some point, a lot of these guys made great money and had great growth and looked like they were going to be hot. And whatever happened over the next 20 years or 30 years, they died. That's what's going to happen. And you know what? Comdex was the same. When I, well, first of all, you all know that. There used to be 25 different search engines. Now there's Google. You know? Um, there used to be uh, a bunch of operating systems. Now there's, now there's Microsoft and iOS. Um, you know, it, it, when we were the first company, there, there used to be 200 companies making computers. The Comdex used to be a hobby show, basically. It was a ton of people who had their own computers. And and, and, they, and, and some people's computers looked totally cool. And some people's computers didn't look cool. And there was no indication of whether they were going to make it or not. Whether they were well-backed or not well-backed was not an indication. Very, very hard to pick winners in a big growth thing like this. But that's why I like the ETF, because you can get on the wave. You know, you can at least get into an ETF. Now, the ETF, of course, is going to still pick a lot of losers. But over the long haul, you don't need too many companies that turn into billion-dollar companies to, to win in the whole ETF. Right? So, so things are going to go in and out of the ETF, but some things that they bought cheap are going to keep going up. You won't know which ones they're going to be, but accidentally, a couple of things that they buy for the ETF are going to start going up and up and up and, and, and bring the whole ETF up. Because currently, the value of the ETF is uh, a very small number, MJ. So the whole ETF is $635 million right now. So if there's one company in this ETF that becomes a billion dollar holding for them, not, it wouldn't be a billion dollar company. They would, they would only own a small percentage of it. But let's say a company becomes a $20 billion marijuana company. They'll have a billion dollars worth of stock. Then the ETF will be worth a lot more than it is now. Plus they'll have other companies. So they only need a certain amount of big successes to win. And their holdings are a lot of... Um, they list them? Yeah, here you go. Canopy Growth, Kronos, Aurora, GW. And you see how they have actually pretty big holdings in, in the big ones. Tilray, uh, Hexo, blah, blah, blah. You know, so they, they, these are their primary holdings, but they keep buying new ones. Every time there's a new IPO, they'll pick up something. Um, so I like it long term. It's just a good way to diversify your investment in pot. I got to tell you, though. All this to me is, is, is honestly bullshit compared to what we're doing at PSW Investments, which is we are buying into these companies before they go public. We're taking them to their public offerings. We're building, and as we're putting in, we're taking these, these, these billion companies, we're finding ones that have good stories and good management teams, and we're giving them the financial expertise to move to the next stage. We're giving them money to grow. We're helping them get leases. We're helping, instead of, instead of using their cash to buy equipment, we're getting them leases. We're getting them uh, lines of credit. You know, things that are tricky for these pot companies to do. We're working out deals that make it work. We're doing land deals where, um, you know, pot companies are all cash. They don't have $2 million, though, to buy a farm, right? Um, and if they, they can't borrow it from a bank because the bank can't do business with them to lend them $2 million. Uh, so we have another company buys the land for $2 million and we do a lease with, a lease with an option to buy for the pot company over 10 years. So they'll pay like, um, let's say we buy the land for $2 million. They'll pay us $200,000 a year in, as a lease 
And then at the end, so we're going to get a whole $2 million back in 10 years. And at any time, they can give us $2.5 million to buy it out. And it rates down over time. But in any case, we'll still get like a half million dollar plus kicker at the end or whatever, you know. So we work it out. So it's like that. Plus, the land people end up owning a piece of the pot company. So it works out for them long term, too. There's all kinds of deals you can structure. And that's my specialty, of course, is structuring deals. So we're getting into those early, early stages and we're getting all these deals done and putting things together. And, you know, we laugh at these public companies, these, you know, um, New Age that we, that PSW owns uh, 25% of right now. Um, they are dropping, I would think about 150,000 a month to the bottom line already. We just put money in six, uh, six months ago. They're not even six months ago. Um, three months ago, we put money into them. Uh, they're already dropping 150,000 on the bottom line. If we can get one permit cleared in California, the fire inspections that we're waiting for, we will be able to double capacity. We'll be dropping 300,000 a month to the bottom line. By next year, we should be able to do 500,000 a month. Middle of next year, we should be able to profit $500,000 a month. That's more than Kilray, more than uh, uh, cannabis, you know, and more than most of the companies that are public, and that's nothing. And we, you know, we, so we're not even going to go public until we're a billion dollar company. And we just, and that's just California. We're adding, we already added Michigan. We're starting up Michigan. We're starting up in Jersey. We hope to get our license very shortly in Jersey. We've got a person in Louisiana. So we're moving into the really, really early stages. And we're, and the capital we deploy there, by the time you see it on a public offering, these companies, you're a thousand times behind the early investors. So, you know, and again, but we're spreading it because we're investing in lots of little companies and we're moving things along and we're picking up guys that are really, you know, really cheap. Not, but, I mean, nothing like what you're paying. You're paying, you know, you go into Tilray, you're paying a billion dollars for Tilray. It's a little, that's crazy. They have no earnings, they have nothing. You know, so, so you come in, you come in on these companies and you've already, if they want to get public, it's way too late. You missed the boat already. And you are the sucker that's paying a thousand times more than the founders. You know, so, so I, you know, I strongly recommend finding a group and, and, and especially if you have local state knowledge and you can help somebody start up a place in, in, a lo in your local area. I think that's way better play, a way better way to go is build something yourself and start it up yourself because there's going to be a lot of success in this industry. There's massive, massive room for growth. All right. So from a stock standpoint, yes, MJ, I like MJ for a long term position. Um, but but it's you're so far behind the eight ball by the time you jump into these these things you've you've missed out on you know people basically people put in the founders put in a million two million dollars ten million dollars maybe into the company by the time you get there you're it's a billion dollar company you're paying a billion dollar valuation that's nuts it's a hundred times behind even if they put in ten million to start you're a hundred times behind those guys. And probably getting a much smaller piece of the business than they got. So, so like I said, the thousand you could be a thousand times behind. So, be very careful about marijuana investing. Be extremely careful about putting your money into these companies. I don't care how hot they look or what they say they're doing. Look at the goddamn balance sheets. Most of these guys don't make a dime. And and believe me, I've seen I've seen pretty much everybody in this business now. Most of them are, are not even good operators. But the problem that's the problem. You don't have to be a good operator. You just have to have pot. There's no skill involved in growing pot and giving it to people. Anybody with a license is making money. But what happens when everyone has licenses? When it's easier to do, then only the most efficient operators are going to make money. So my attitude is start with the most efficient operators and make them more efficient and note them and, and give them the marketing tools that they need and make the connections, make the deals that we need to ensure that we have bigger supplies, better delivery systems, better access to, to distribution channels and make a real company out of it. Instead of because anybody can turn around and say, OK, we buy this pot for this, we sell it for that. That's not a business, though. That's not a business for the long term. You've got to be in it for the long term. You've got to treat it like a real company. So, and, and again, I cannot stress enough, when you're buying any of these companies, I mean, look here. Uh, I mean, let's look at a couple of these things. Um, canopy growth, right? So they're, they're well-known, big success, right? Market cap, $15 billion. 
financials. 77 million in sales, negative 54 million in profits quarterly. Are they improving? Oh, yeah, real good improvement. 23 million in sales to the quarter. So they're going from 73 million last year to 100 million in sales, losing $300 million. That's not a company I would pay $15 billion for. And, and again, it's not a complicated business. There's no genius to what they're doing. Uh, Kronos, $2 billion. What do we get for $2 billion? Let's see. Ooh, $4 million in sales. I'm excited. I don't know what that is. They, they must have bought a shell. Because there's no, I mean, obviously, there's no way they did this. So it must be some kind of old shell. Um, quarterly basis. Got to look at the quarterly. Again, Three million sales, three million sales, three million sales. <laughs> this is like funny. Um, we are we're, we're doing one we're doing one point five. So we're we're one point five million sales at New Age, and we're going to double it to three million sales. We are dropping cash to the bottom line. These guys are losing seven million dollars on 3 million in sales, they're losing twice as much as they're selling. We're doing 3 million sales, we're making $500,000. They're doing 3 million sales, they're losing $7 million. The same freaking business. Yet, they have a valuation of $2 billion. So PSW Investments, if we realize that, that kind of valuation in PSW Investments, we're gonna have 500 million dollars <laughs> it's like a, it's a joke don't take it we're not going to it's stupid it's like a beanie baby it's not there's nothing real in these numbers these are insane numbers they're not justifying in any way shape or form we'll justify it because i said to my guys this weekend i said look you want to be a billion dollar company make 50 million in profit and you're a billion dollar company at 20x that's how you become a billion dollar company. Not by doing this bullshit. This is just a freaking vaporware situation. The sales are out there. It's a, it's a $200 billion business. You can easily make $50 million selling. Uh, sell. The profits are, right? We're, make, we're clearing about 30% profits right now. Even if the business matures, it's going to be like a farming business. It'll make 10%, whatever. Um, and by the way, we're not growers at all. We are we are manufacturers, so we take the pot from the growers, we process it into oils, both uh, CBD for the medical side and THC for the uh, for the fun side for the edibles and things like that. And we process the oil. The oil sells right now for nine to ten thousand dollars a liter, and we make about three thousand dollars on that. Our goal is to get our yield up and to make $4,000 to $4,500 per liter. So almost a 50% profit on our sales. And we partner up with growers. We partner up with distributors. Everybody wants to partner up with us because distributors need the oil to make their products. The growers need to be able to sell their product, turn their products into oil to make them more sellable. So that's what we do. So I love the middleman business. I like that aspect of it much more than I want. I don't want to own farms that burn up in California. I don't want to own farm. You know, I don't want to have to deal with labor stuff and things like that. We have a small little manufacturer that can turn out quite a lot of product. It's really a matter of just buying more machines. So that that's the kind of business I like to be in. I mean, but there's a huge amount of expertise involved, which again is why I love Ken. He's like the, he's the greatest expert I've ever come across in this sort of thing. And my and my my stepfather was a chemist. He's a big top-notch polymer chemist. So I I do I understand the concept of everything Ken understands, except he he's like my dad. He knows all this shit cold, and that's so valuable. But anyway, point being. Uh, all these companies' valuations and such a bullshit, but some of them are going to grow into it because some of them, you know, I mean, Cronus is spending a ton of money. Um, Tory is spending a ton of money. They're all spending money buying up farms, buying up distribution, and so on and so forth. Um, that maybe down the road, a couple of them will, will end up being a Walmart. You know, somebody's going to be the Walmart of cannabis. Somebody's going to, to, to do very well. You know, some of the farmers are going to do fantastically, but 
Who knows which one? Who knows which one's going to do? You know, look at Walmart, right? Out of, out of a thousand different little stupid general stores, Walmart took over the universe. Who's going to be the Walmart of cannabis? We don't know. Hopefully, it'll be one of the ones that these guys pick. And, and I met these guys, actually. They're, they're reasonably intelligent. They're shopping the show just like I'm shopping the show. They're looking for up-and-coming companies. Um, they, they, you know, they, they're, they're, they're parameters are a certain way because they have to pick things that are public and so on and so forth. But, you know, they're doing what, they're doing what we're doing. They're, they're shopping, looking for, for reasonably priced companies that they can add to their portfolio that will hopefully uh, do well in the future. But they also don't know for sure. They don't know which one's going to be super successful, but it's the diversification that counts. When you're into a gold rush sort of business like this, you want to be diversified. You want to have your fingers in a lot of pots. And that's why what we're doing is we're going into every state we go into, we're partnering. And because of our manufacturing expertise, this is the coolest thing. We go into New Jersey. We don't pay a penny. We go into New Jersey we meet with people who are getting a license and putting millions and millions of dollars into getting a license. And we say, we'll be your manufacturer in exchange for 20% of your company. Plus, you'll pay us uh, a discounted rate, but you'll pay us a profit to manufacture for you exclusively. And we're getting those deals. So without risking any cash, we're going to own 10%, 20% of dozens, maybe 100 different companies. And we'll get a piece of those revenue streams. And that's how we're going to get to that's how we're going to get to fifty million dollars. We're not going to we don't need to invest three hundred million to get to fifty million. We, we can we can do it the old fashioned way by making deals. So that's my story with marijuana. And I, I just want to make you understand the difference between like what you know the early stage guys are ripping cash and so on and so forth. But by the time you're seeing these things on the open market, it's late. It's super late. Uh, Brian says, which way do we see CL going? I Look, I thought it would go up into the holiday. It's not really going up into the holiday. Um, it's a disaster. This is a, an incredibly, 55 is a very, very, very disappointing number. It should have been like 62 at least, and it's 55, and I don't see what they've got for a catalyst going down the road. So unless unless OPEC... In December, when they have their meeting, or November, they're going to have a meeting in November, unless OPEC, and well, when is it? Let's see. Um, I am missing the keyboard by miles. OPEC meeting. OPEC meeting, OPEC meeting, Vienna. I, yeah. OPEC meeting. I'm like the degree. Vienna meeting. Come on, give me a date. Oh, it has to be December, obviously. December 6th. There you go. I'm thinking like the wrong month. All right, so December 6th is the OPEC meeting. And um, oh, I'm going to a party on December 6th. <laughs> uh, anyway, so there's a party, there's a party at a meeting. And if they don't cut on December 6th, they're in trouble. They're in big trouble. So I, I, it's going to be otherwise random, though. We're not betting it right now. Rob says, as a new member, what is the setup you're using on this screen? The green and red lines are purple. Oh, I haven't been asked that in a while. All right. <clears throat> on Thinkorswim, these are what you call pivot points. And the way you get them is if you're on a blank chart, you just click on the chart. You go to uh, studies, you add a study, and it's a trend study, and then you go to the thing, the L to P, and there's pivot points, and you click on that, it adds it on there. And by, and, and by the way, these configurations, ah, I'm gonna move this. Uh, somewhere, there's a thing to save the configuration. Is it this? No. Um, oh, wait, maybe it's here. Style. Save style. There you go. See under style? So once you have the thing you like, you save the style. So like for me, my, oh, I didn't, mm -hmm. I don't want to change it. Uh, see, I have, see, it says load style and it says three day style. So I need my style. I have three day futures, futures, normal futures too. So those are my styles. And this is what I call my three day normal style. 
And, um, and so it's a three day chart the way I have, I have it set up the way I like it. I have the pivot points the way I like it. I have these things, which I like. I like to know what my lows and highs are. And um, that's it. I mean, it's a like, nice, quick, simple view of what's going on. So that, that's called a pivot point study. That's how you get that. It's very useful. What do you think of XRT here? I think, yes, I think overall retail is probably oversold. Um, I think it's going to be very hard for Christmas to disappoint at this, you know, the, from where we are. It's kind of hard for Christmas to be worse than people expect. Um, what? Oh, there's no Y in XRT. So, again, it's an ETF. And, and I think overall, I, I, I think XRT is a good buy at this point. I mean, individual retailers are a little more exciting to me, but XRT is certainly a good play here. Uh, if we look at the longer term chart, okay, here you go. Do the longer term chart, we really don't get much below 40. So if we call 40 a consolidation line, right? then a uh, 50% move up would be 60, obviously never got there. A 25% uh, move up from 40 is obviously 50, and that's where we got to. So what do we have here? We have a 25% move up. And how much, and, then, and now if you have a 25% move up from 40 to 50, this is an overshoot. So 40 to 50 is 10. Your retrace on the 5% rule is 20% of your move up. So, the, so in other words, a re, an overshoot would be $2, right? Because it's going to overshoot the same as a retrace. So your overshoot is going to be 20% of the move up. So 52 is your overshoot. And here it is right here. 52, you overshot the mark. That's a good indication that the move was only going to be 50 once you see failing at 52. The, and then let's say the move was only 50. The real move, because now we're going to consolidate. But if you're going to go higher, you're going to consolidate below the 50 line. But given the state of retail, I would bet we're not going to go higher than 50. I don't think that I don't think we're pausing for a move up. I think that people got overly enthusiastic of retail and never should have been this high in the first place. But should we be going back to 40? Also, no, because why? Because the range used to be about 40 to 44. OK, and then and it's been up and down. You, you go a little below sometimes, a little above sometimes. But the range used to be 40 to 44 for XRT. We have more jobs, but more importantly than more jobs, we have more uh, better salaries. Money is getting into the consumer's hands. For the first time in many, many, many years, people are getting actual raises. Raises that matter, not 2% bullshit raises. People are getting 5%, 10% raises. Jobs are enticing people to come work in different places. People need workers, and there's a demand, and wages are going up, and minimum wages is rising too. That's putting a lot of money back in the consumer's hands. That's very, very positive to the economy over the long term. So in general, I would say easily 10%. So I think 44 could be the new base. Now, meanwhile, if the move is to 50, the retraces are 48 and 46. Weak retrace is 48. Strong retrace is 46. We have a little consolidation here. We spike down, but we spike down over this panicky crap. I think we're going to settle back up above 44, and I think the new line is going to be basically 44 to 10%, let's say 48. I think we're going to be probably in the 44, 48 range mostly. Doesn't mean we won't go below, but just you can keep returning to that number. So I do like, I do like XRT here. I don't think we're going to sustain a move below 44. And really, since 46 is a retrace, I think you can pretty much count on 46 being a, being a pretty good line that we're going to you know, generally be above it. So 44 is going to be hopefully your lows at this point. Instead of being your highs, as it used to be, it's now going to be the lows, which means obviously this is a good time to get in. Now, the great thing about options is you don't need something to go up to make money. Is actually the greatest thing about options. We just need to say this is a good floor. We want to invest here. So we look at um, XRT, and you go to 2021. You can sell the $40 puts, which are quite a bit out of more 10 percent out of the money. You can sell the $40 puts for like 340. Last bid was 340 on these, right? And you can buy. The, uh, let's say you buy the, 
Mm, okay, the 40s for like nine bucks. You know, eight ninety nine twenty five. Let's say nine ten, whatever. So you buy the forties for about nine bucks, and you sell the forty uh, sixes because we don't. We're not anticipating a big move. You sell the forty sixes for five seventy five. So nine minus five seventy five is twenty five. Uh, Three twenty five. So you have a a. Um, I'm sorry. We start with a forty, right? So it's a forty 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 six spread for three twenty five. So it's a six dollar spread for three twenty five. You have hundred percent upside just on the spread, but if you offset that by selling these puts for, for more than three twenty five, you have an absolutely free play where you're going to make all the money that XRT is above forty up until forty six. Now you can do a half sale, and your net cost will be a buck fifty on the spread, right? Because you're paying for half of the three twenty five spread with the with the short puts. So your net cost will be a buck fifty. That's still great. You can have twice as many upside plays. But then your break even would be forty one fifty, and anything above forty one fifty, you're going to make uh, two dollars up to forty six. So your potential there is for uh, four fifties worth of gains, or nine dollars. Sorry, nine dollars worth of gains above between forty uh, one fifty and forty six. So that's a great way to play because you're already at forty five. <laughs> so basically, you, you're at your goal now, and it can only, you know, it really can, if it just has to improve a little tiny bit, and you're going to make a massive amount of money. That's the kind of stocks, that's the kind of plays I love to set up. GE, <clears throat> three says, I got put stocks on all my outstanding short 2020 18 puts. Seems to be happening to others as well. You have so much experience in the market. Is that normal to be put the stock if? Yeah, sure, because once there's no premium in it, um, GE, in other words, if you if you have a 2020, okay, the 2020, da, 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 let's see what put she said. 18 puts. So the 2020 18 puts are 1020. GE is at 780. There's basically zero premium in the puts. So if I want to unload a lot of GE stock without moving it, all I want, I can then exercise the puts, which force you to pay me 18 for my stock. That's why I sold them to you in the first place. I want to force you to pay me $18 for my stock, no matter how cheap it gets. And now that there's no premium, there's no reason for me not to take the $18 for the GE stock. It's, it's, I'm getting a double back on, on what I'm holding. So, um, and it pretties up, if I'm a hedge fund, it pretties up my books and makes it look like I did something smart. You know, there's all kinds of reasons for it. So, yeah. Now, bottom line is you lost what you lost. You know, if you had a $10 put here and someone exercises it for 18, so they're going to give you the stock. They're going to take $18, but they're going to cancel this contract for 10. So out of your account only comes the extra 780. And that's what you really just paid for the stock. The loss was a loss. It didn't change. You, you you know you had that loss anyway. It didn't change the loss. Now instead, though, instead of just canceling the put, you have the loss. It's not a big deal though because now you just say, okay, I now own GE at 18. So do you want to keep it or do you want to turn it back into something with options? Um. So ba basically, you can expect to get assigned when the when the short puts run out of premium. You can expect an assignment because then there's no reason for the person to keep it open. Um, and GE is going to be a very, very long-term recovery. I don't know if I'd want to keep the cash in the stock, but the bottom line is I assume you sold the puts for, let's say, two bucks. So you're down eight bucks. You know, you're down eight bucks. There's no reason to hold the stock for eight bucks because now, you know, because now you're sitting there with a $16 exposure. You're down eight dollars and you have eight dollars worth of stock that you're not really, you don't even really want. The real question is saying, how do I make eight bucks back on GE? Okay, so. You know, I would dump, I would dump the stock. I would recommit to buying the stock for eight dollars by selling these puts, the uh, 2021 eight dollar puts. You sell those for two twenty. So now you're netting back in for six. So you've already you see what you've done. You own the stock for eight. You already all you got to do is recommit to owning it, and now you now you're down to six for net. That's you just gave yourself twenty five percent discount for nothing. So why on earth would I hold the cash for eight? Makes no sense. Um, so now you're you're selling these puts for eight. Obviously, someone's going to assign them to you, but that's that. 
you'd be no, no worse than you are now. Then you could buy the fives for four bucks and sell the tens for a buck eighty. Well, you know, uh, it's not really two. So let's let's call it a buck eighty and a buck and four ten is a uh, two thirty. So if this is two thirty, and this is two and this is two ten, two twenty. Um, it's net. It's not net. It's a net credit. So it's a, so for zero, you have these five dollars spreads. So you can promise to buy the stock back to you know as you, you dump what you have. You promise to buy the stock back to eight. You take the five ten spread, and if GE makes it to ten, you're going to get back five bucks per contract. So most of what you lost, you're going to get back. You do if you want to do 1.5 times, you'll get back the entire eight dollars of what you lost. So that that's the way I would try to recover it, not to sit on the stock just because it's assigned to you. There's no real logic to owning the stock. You know, they're not, they're not even paying a dividend anymore. Eric says, "What are your thoughts on natural gas over the next year or so?" Um. I, I, natural gas, we're done with natural gas. I, 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 my thoughts on natural gas two years ago, three years ago, were that LNG, liquefied natural gas, was going to cause U.S. natural gas to equalize with the global prices, and global prices were significantly higher than what we had in the U.S. That's now happened. My target was 450. Natural gas hit 450. We, we killed the play just last week or so. Um, I called for that play to be taken off the table when we hit 450. So I said, that's it. We're done. Play's over. So honestly, I I could care less about natural gas now. Here's what I think is going to happen long term. We're going to drift around now. 450 is a new normal for the price in the U.S. We have a glut of natural gas here, but we ship it out on a on a more and more increasing basis. Um, the rest of the world's prices are going to come down, and eventually, I think all natural gas will be 450. But what's happening next, though, is we're a rich company. We have companies that easily went public and, and built these liquefied natural gas terminals because they can run the numbers and show that they'll be able to export the $2 natural gas in the U.S. to other countries where they're willing to pay six bucks. So very easy to get investors. And we have a lot of projects that have been done. And they're in the world, there's projects in the works, there's projects that are already done, blah, blah, blah. Now, and we have pipelines and so on and so forth, infrastructure that takes the natural gas from the from the places and puts it around. But natural gas isn't that hard to get. Everyone's got it. Like everywhere there's an oil well, there's natural gas with the oil. It gets usually wasted. They usually burn it off. It's not worth keeping because it costs more to transport than you're going to get for it. Uh, because of liquefied natural gas, so the, the economics are changing. And so everyone's going to start capturing natural gas, exporting natural gas, so on and so forth. And what's going to happen is in a couple of years, there's going to be a massive global glut and the whole thing's going to crash. That's when I want to get back in. Right now, I could give, give two craps about what happens to natural gas anymore. I've lost interest completely. We hit our goal. We're done. It was a great play. Um, it was our trade of the year two years ago, and, and it hit the numbers we thought it would hit, and that's that. We're on to the next thing. We're on to IBM. Today, IBM is our trade of the year. I go, oh, we got to talk about that. So this year, now IBM is my trade of the year. In two years from now, people are saying, what do you think about IBM? So we have, we're done with it. When it's $200, we're going to be done with it. Right now, it's 117 bucks. I'm not done with it. It's exciting. I, I get excited about the things that are still cheap. I'm excited about pot companies because they're ridiculously cheap. If you buy them, if you really, if you buy the company, if you go to the market, they're not cheap. So I have no interest in public pot companies other than that ETF. Uh, I have no interest in public power companies, but I have a huge interest in cheap power companies. This is how I buy things. This is how I always buy companies. When I did M&A, this is how I always looked at M&A deals. I want to buy things cheaply. That way you make money. <laughs> I don't know, maybe I'm crazy, but that's my thing. Once, it, once it's not cheap, I don't want it. I, you know, and, and I know it's hard because you know you follow the site, you come in, oh, he's a big natural gas expert, blah, blah, blah. I'm not, I, I became a natural gas expert because it caught my eye and I thought it was really cheap. And I learned all about the market and I got into it. It did what I thought it would do. It's done. It's over. Now I have to start learning something else. Not biotech, though. The next question is on biotech. Uh, Samir says, biotech is sold off along with the rest of the market. What are your thoughts on Again, now biotech is certainly the future. Also, they're very hard to pick ones. Tiva is not a biotech. Tiva is a, a, a manufacturer of drugs. 
Um, they don't really develop things themselves. They, they develop ways to copy what other people have. Gilead is more of a biotech. Um, Celgene, we just put money into. We had a top trade alert on Celgene because it got cheap again. Um, I like them for the long term, but it also is, again, you, you've got to diversify your investments because you don't know who's going to have the next top thing. You don't know who's going to have a breakthrough and have the next billion dollar drug. You got to look at their pipeline, look at the research, so on and so forth. So, Gene, I, I'm a little iffy on their pipeline, but I kind of like where they're going. And also, the big knock on So, Gene, they've got a blockbuster drug already, Rebel Med, that's good for $10 billion a year in profit. One drug. It's not going to last, but it's still there. And, and so people are treating them like it's dead already. It's not dead. They still got two, three, four years of good money coming in. During that time, hopefully they'll intelligently take their $10 billion and invest it in things that make money down the road. And they have started to do that. But all the investors see is, okay, you got this drug and this drug is, is getting off schedule and then you're screwed. But I see them as a company that's, that's probably got it together to do it. Gilead, I love. Gilead is an old time pharma company. Good with the research, so on and so forth. I don't see any reason not to own them for the long term. But that's what you want to do. You want to, you want to have companies that have serious R and D backgrounds, not flash in the pan guys. Be very, very careful about people who have one thing and their whole company is based on like something they invented. Because what happens is, you know, if you invent something that's fantastic, or you come up with this incredible drug, and they they build a company around the drug that you invented. That's no good. You want a company that, like Pfizer that was built to invent things that successfully came up with some drugs and is working on 100 more. That's a good investment. But very, very many of these companies are, an, are a successful product that had a company built around the product. And that's what you call a real one-trick pony. You don't want to get involved in those. You've got to be careful about which ones you invest in. And then you've got to really study and really learn what the pipelines are, know what's in development, know what their R&D plans are, look at the cash flow, see if they can justify it, so on and so forth. It's, it's, it's very tricky, but also there are some great bargains in the sector. Apple, what's your favorite today? Facebook or Apple? Definitely Apple. I know you love Apple. Yes, definitely Apple. <laughs> There's no company with better fundamentals than even Facebook. But given Facebook has been indiscriminately sold off, yes, it has. We just we just sold a we just found Facebook on another play that we did on a relative valuation basis between two, which went off of it. Apple, 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 and Apple, and when in doubt, Apple. All right. Um, it's not even it's not even a thing. I don't want to waste anyone's time, but come on. I mean, let, let's let's just. Okay. Where's my freaking ah? Here you go. Okay, look. All right, look. Apple. No, actually, you know what? Sorry, let's do Facebook. Face. Got to do Facebook first. Facebook. Nope. Not DFB. Facebook. Thank you, Mr. Keyboard. Got this tiny little keyboard. I got a new one. Oh, come on. There we go. <laughs> you have to pay for this thing. All right. <clears throat> Here is Facebook. $55 billion in revenue. $21 billion in profit. That's really nice, isn't it? That's Facebook. And you can get the company for $380 billion. Now look at Apple, AAPL. Apple, $265 billion in revenue, $60 billion in profit, growing rapidly. And you can buy this whole company for $800 billion. It is not three times more expensive than Facebook. And Apple is sitting on... $250 billion in cash. So really, you're buying the company. So if you're buying a company that has $250 billion in cash, you can take the cash, 
out of the company, if you buy the whole company, you can take the cash out of the company, put it back in your bank right after you buy it. So you're really buying Apple for $600 billion, not even twice as much as Facebook. But they have three times Facebook's revenue uh, earnings. And I forgot what Facebook's revenue was, but it wasn't, I mean, it was uh, 50 billion, five times revenue. It's 400, and it's really 400 billion their market cap. So you're paying, you get, so, so you're paying 1.5 times for Apple, and they make three times more money. It's not even, it's not even similar. It's not, they're not even on the same planet. Um, also, uh, from a um, from a market concentrate from a future standpoint, okay. Facebook has 3 billion people or 3.5 billion people using Facebook. They're getting about um, about uh, $15 a person. Well, let's say, let's say well, yeah, about 15, 20, 15, 20, they make 15 to 20 dollars per user. It's not likely they're going to go past 4.5 billion. You know, they, they, it's hard for them to, to really grow more than they have. They've already got everybody in the world who has a computer, pretty much has Facebook. They're going to have a hard time growing. And they say, well, what are they going to do to, to drive more revenues to the bottom line? How do they get from 20 billion to 40 billion? Now we had Apple's already at 60. How does Facebook get from 20 to 40? I don't know. I'm not sure what they can really do more to monetize what they've got. And not only that, though, but regulators are circling around on saying you've already done too much. You're already, you're already abusing your position. You're already selling data you don't have the right to. You're already violating people's privacy to make a buck. Apple doesn't have these problems. You know what the regulators say to Apple? Can I get an iPhone? <laughs> can I get a new iPhone for my kids? Um, that's what the regulators say to Apple. Um, Apple clearly has competition. There's no danger of being regulated. They have a, a in, 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 in raw number of phones, they have a fairly uh, small part of the global marketplace. But they have the profitable part of the global marketplace. Now, what can Apple do to go from, from 50 billion to 100 billion? Well, uh, for starters, um, iCar. All right, and not selling a car, but let's say that an option on your car is an Apple entertainment system that when you go, when you walk into your car, they have, they have an auto play now, but let's say that develops further and it becomes an option that the factory gives. It's like a Bose sound system, right? Or something like that. You get an Apple system. What does the Apple system do? The Apple system, uh, when you walk in the car, it links with your phone and mimics everything on your phone in the car, all your preferences, all your music, all your things that you like, the environment of the car. Why is that important? Because when we get, when we start sharing cars, when you start getting picked up by a self-driving car, you don't want to be picked up by a droney car for the day to go somewhere. You don't want to take a two-hour ride in a drone car that doesn't have anything you like in it. But when you walk into the car, if the environment of the car on the way to pick you up configures itself to be what you want it to be, then that's much more attractive to you as a user. How much would that cost? A thousand, two thousand dollars to add that to a car times millions and millions of cars is Apple's next fifty million dollars a year, fifty billion dollars a year in profit. Just something like that. Then the home. How about when you walk into a house? How about when you go into a hotel? They're working on all this stuff. When you walk into a hotel room, why isn't the temperature the way you like it? Why isn't the lighting the way you like it? Why aren't the windows the way you like it? Why isn't the food being ordered the way you like it? Why don't you have an easy access to a menu? Check out everything else on your phone. Why don't you have a freaking TV guide on your phone that tells you what's actually on the hotel TV? You know how annoying that is? They spend a week in a hotel second time. <laughs> it's so annoying not you know, I have no idea what's on. Why? It's so stupid. It's so easy to fix. So look for Apple home environments, Apple this environment, you know, Apple spaces. And people who like Apple want their Apple spaces. They're high-end consumers. They expect that kind of treatment. They're going to get it. So I can easily see Apple doing $100 billion a year. I have no idea how Facebook will ever get to, to even close to where Apple is now. So that's why there's no contest. Okay, next. <laughs> so 
Bill, and, and not only that, but even, even with the drop in Facebook, there's still over 20 times earnings right now. Apple's 10 times earnings right now. Uh, hi, Phil. Thoughts on Mo as a uh, new trade? Um, yeah, I think, if, I think ultimately um, it is Mo that's in the U.S., right? Yeah. Ultimately, they'll, they're going to take over the pop business. Every, in fact, everybody I talk to in the pop business knows that. In fact, it's, all, all you're really doing is setting yourself up to be acquired by a major tobacco company in the pop business. That's, that's effectively the future. There's only, you know, not many people think that they're going to get around that. Um, you know, five, ten years down the line, it's going to consolidate by the big guys and big tobacco companies who, you know, as big as we get, you know, let, let's say I let's say New Age does a hundred million dollars uh, a year in profits, and we're a two, three billion dollar company, four billion dollar company. Still, he's still chicken feed for motor bias. So they're going to, they're going to buy. Uh, you know, once it's once it's nationally legal, which is going to take several years, there'll be a, a pretty fast wave of consolidation in the industry after that, and people are going to get swept up and done. And I, I, I said this to my guys. I'm like, well, you don't want to be the last one to get sold because that ain't going to work. I said, when, when the offers start coming in, you say thank you and you get out. That's it. Because you can't, you can't risk it. You can't risk it getting crushed by all these big national guys. So, we, you know, we hopefully will be in on the early part of the process. But yeah, so Philip Morris, I still like him for the long term. Um, tobacco is done. The vaping thing going down is good for them. People treating it like it's bad for them. Um, but but it's good for them because it was a problem. They were they were losing market share in an uncontrolled manner, and this uh, sudden burst of uh, concern for people's safety is probably prodded by them just to knock down the vaping people. But the, but they crashed completely from that. So and then, you know we we picked them up actually down here, and they're back to where we like them. You know we like them down here. This is cheap enough to pick up, so I do like them down there. Um, you know, and, and also it's great to it's great to get something when it looks like a falling knife, but you know there's a value that underpins what you got. So like for Philip Morris, um, if you sell the uh, the fifty dollar puts in 2021 for like mm, you know six seven or six seventy, let's say that's a lot of money. That's that's net forty two thirty. That's crazy. That's twelve dollars below this. It's more than twenty percent below the current price. Um, if you consider that free money because you're happy to buy Philip Morris for 50, you put that to work with, let's say, the 50 calls for uh, this, basically the same amount of money for about seven, for about eight bucks. And um, wait, 50 calls, sorry. Yeah, 50 calls, less than eight bucks. And um, let's say these, the 62, I go for that, 62 50s because you need at least three bucks back. So you're netting five on the spread, the 50, 62, 50 spread, but you're offsetting it with the 50 calls at, at seven bucks, so almost seven bucks. So let's say you split that, uh, so you're doing two longs, right? So you'd have $25 worth of longs for, I'm sorry, I forgot the number now, um, eight minus three is five. So for ten dollars, you'd have these longs, and for and you'd knock three fifty off the price of each side off the off the ten. So, oh, I'm sorry, you're knocking seven off each ten. So you're ending up net three. So for net three, you've got twenty five dollars worth of upside on Philip Morris, and you're already in the money by four bucks. So that that's the way I would play that for long term recovery. If he splits up in a big way uh, and spins off GE power, what happens with my like $10 longs? I don't know. It depends on how they structure it. Um, they may uh, take a cash uh, input and distribute the cash. Or what the hell was that? Well, that's weird. I don't know if you guys can hear that. What am I? It's like the TiVo making a weird sound. Um, it's like the hard drive is reformatting or something. So what was I going to say? GE. Um, so they might do that. You might end up owning uh, some GE and something else and some of whatever the new company is. Uh, some other company may buy it. You may end up with shares of that company. Who knows? It's, it happens when it happens. Um, CS so says, you've always said Amazon was never worth investing due to its financials to giving a massive valuation. Due to its financials? No, no. Due to the fact that it has a massive valuation. It was never it was never worth investing in because it's a freaking retailer and and it's never going to make that kind of money. 
And, and yeah, okay, if you want to say, yeah, you always said that. I always said that. It's not worth it. It's not worth 100 times earnings. It wasn't when it was half the price it is now, it wasn't worth 100 times earnings then. And yes, they doubled their earnings. So now it's only um, the price. So the stock is doubled and it's still 100 times earnings. Because they're not earning much more than double what they earned. So, you know, look, feel, feel free to buy them. I just don't chase stocks like that. And I'm never going to recommend a stock like that. It's ridiculous. It's just not worth investing. It's too scary. We, we made good money shorting Amazon. When Amazon hit 2100 this year, we made a ton of money shorting it. I'd rather make money doing that than playing it long. Because to me, playing something long when it's trading 100 times what it makes, I don't want to own that stock. There, there are so many good, cheap companies to buy. Why would I mess, why would I mess around with something like that? Mike says, regarding cannabis investment, what do you think of APHA? I don't even know which one that is, frankly. So um, ask me in the chat room. I'd be happy to look it up. Um, do you like Boeing down here near 300? I wish I did. Um, uh, Boeing. I love Boeing, and I, I think it's a great long-term play. I don't think 300 is that cheap, but let's take a look. EA. What? Not Bangkok Airways. You know, this is a Stockopedia. You have to buy a subscription for every country you want to look up. So I only have a U.S. subscription. Why does it show me freaking Chinese stocks if I only have a U.S. subscription? I don't want to see the Chinese stocks. I don't want to see the European stocks. I want to see just the stocks I have. But it's fantastic if you want to look up other countries. If you want to play other markets, it's great. Um, so BA is now $180 billion, and they make $10 billion. They're trading at about 18, at about, you know, a little bit more than uh, 10 times. No, I'm sorry, 10. They're, they're trading close to 20 times sales. So it's a fairly normal price. Now, the thing about BA, though, is, of course, they've got back orders for the next 10 years. So I think they're fairly steady and that they're going to generally grow and make more money over time. Um, they're in a very big, positive 10-year cycle for planes. So I don't, I don't like them enough that I would jump in on them. If, they, if for some reason the market collapsed and they went down to 200, I would be super excited. But 300 is like, that's about what they should be. You know, and, 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 and I don't think it's a bad play. I wouldn't say it's a bad idea to buy them, but it's not, it's not like I have other places to put $300 that I think could make more money, like Apple, for starters. <laughs> I, I, think, I think if I give Apple $170, I'm going to feel a lot better about that thing in, in 10 years than I will about giving Boeing uh, $300. There's a lot more chance Apple goes to $300 than Boeing goes to $600. Uh, we sold Apple 95 puts last week. At what point do we add a bull call spread? When you think it flattens out, when when we when you feel confident about it, we already have uh, bull call spreads in Apple. So um, for our purposes, we've already made that commitment. Um, I, I just thought the uh, those puts were extremely compelling. I'm sorry, they were 95 or 195. I don't know what we sold. Um, it doesn't sound right somehow. Anyway, well, whatever puts it is you sold. The point is, when Apple does show you some sort of flattening activity, and hopefully it'll hold up around here. I had said 184 was probably going to hold. It hasn't held, but also we're just probably overshooting the correction. And again, 5% rule, let's work on it. To be automatic, where did Apple top out? 230, right? 228, 227, 232. So let's say Apple tops out at 230. So 230 times 0. 0.8 is 184. That's where we got that from, by the way. All right, so 184. Now, 184 uh, minus 230 is 46. So that means there's nine point moves from 184, right? If it's 46, then basically the, the bounces on Apple from 146 should be nine points. If it bounces nine points from 184, what else does that mean? That means nine dollars down is an overshoot. So where's that going to take you? That's going to take you to 175. Where did Apple finish up? 175.51. Okay, I can tell you that. You can ask me over here. I can tell you. I've done the same math. I'd say, well, okay, here's the amount. If we have a 20% correction in Apple, it's going to go to 184, and if it overshoots, it's going to go to 175. 
But going to 175 doesn't mean 184 failed. It means it overshot. It'll most likely go right back to 184. And then we're going to test the bounces, which will be nine points going this way, which is 193, which happens to be the 200-day moving average. And then over 193 is going to be 202, which is right in the middle of the range over here. And what's going to happen is that it'll keep the blue line will keep going down, the red line will keep going up, it'll do a triangle squeaky thing, and it'll pop back up there once it has good earnings. All right, that's what's going to happen. You guys can save this recording. Now, that's what Apple's going to do for the next quarter. And between now and the next earnings report, they're going to go back to here to 184. They're going to go past that line. They're going to come back to 192. They're going to consolidate here. They're going to move up into this range. They're going to squeeze along in the middle of this range. When these two things start coming together, they're going to be right about the earnings report. will be right here, and the blue and the red will be intersecting almost. And then Apple's going to have earnings and go flying back up. That's what's going to happen to Apple. All right, so there's, there's your play. Um, your opinion on CRM and Roku. <laughs> uh, wow. I mean, this is my job. I'm not Kramer. I don't like, I mean, I can't like every single company. Um, I like Salesforce more, more than uh, Roku. Yeah, they like, it, I don't like that business that much. CRM, um, I like them. They got a good position. The business is good. Um, they make good money. Where are we? Uh, too many things. CRM. What? Ah, it's so annoying. Show me the damn thing I want to see. The CRM you pay $90 billion to get I, it is weird. Why is that? I see. I, I wouldn't touch him because I don't know what's going on there. Why do they only have 127 million in profit? What did they do? I'd have to investigate that before I do it. Now, if they actually can pull off two billion going forward, it's still too expensive. So it's still not something I. I, I just wouldn't buy it. I'm not going to pay 50 times earnings to them, especially when they suddenly jump from from 200 million to two billion. I'm like, why did you suddenly do that? I'm not sure why it, it went like that or what the, where those revenues are coming from or are they sustainable? So that's a little weird to me. Roku, forget it. Roku is another ridiculous one. Um, what are they selling for? Four and a half billion. Holy crap. This is a joke. Okay, so the, the main thing I want you to take away from this, why would you do this? Why would you give nine, four point, I've got, you've got $4.5 billion and you're going to buy a company with $500 million in sales for $4.5 billion? Forget profit, there are no profits. Even if they had a profit, $500 million in sales. Why would you use your capital that way? It's a terrible use of money. Just give them 500 million. If you just gave them 500 million dollars and told them to take it over 10 years, they would make more money than they're going to make if you give them 4.5 billion dollars. The best, the best thing you can do is arrange to like buy a subscription for 10 million a year and 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 jump up and boost their earnings so that they look it. But but no, it's not. I wouldn't give them that money. Are you kidding me? Which way do you see CL going? Oh, we asked that already. So no, don't let them see. I don't see any cat any real catalyst for them. Are you still bullish on LB? Absolutely. I'm more. I, L, ah. Dividend cuts are good. Dividend cuts. I'm not a. I'm not a coupon clipper. I'm not in the stocks. Most stocks are not into the dividends. I want my company to do well. I want my company to take the money that they make and reinvest it and build for the future. Not pay out dividends. Paying out dividends is what you do if you have no idea what else you should do with your money. There's no growth in paying out dividends. I mean, if you make insane amounts of money like Apple does, you say, well, we've got to give some of this money away. I mean, it's just sitting in the bank. That makes some sense. I, you know, a lot of companies are in that position. G, you know, a lot of big blue chips have so much money. They're like, well, we can't always figure out something to do with it. So we're going to you know, pay some back. But companies that pay big dividends or they impact their bottom line, that's not it. It's never a good idea. Um, but of course, there's REITs and things like that, which is set up for that. Um, anyway, so LB, I'm super bullish on LB. LB and Haynes, HBI, are both ridiculously underpriced retail stocks, both trading about 10 times earnings, 
Both are iconic companies that are that have name recognition, brand value, uh, distribution networks, followings. It, it's just you know, there's no reason for it. They won't stay down forever. So I like to just keep putting money into them until they come back. That's all. Eventually they will. All right. Two thirty. Okay. Three says happy Thanksgiving. Well, happy Thanksgiving, to everybody. It's a good point. We should say that. Where did you get the nine points in your Apple explanation? Oh boy. Okay. Let's go back to that. Um, Apple. Because we had a forty-five dollar drop from two thirty to one eighty-four. Or a forty-six dollar drop from two thirty to one eighty-four was a thirty-six dollar drop or something. Oh, I'm sorry, forty-six dollar drop, and then forty-six times zero point twenty percent of the forty-six is nine. Not is not nine, obviously it's nine twenty, but you know it was nine. Then you think you, again. You just you have to realize I made this rule up. It's not a law of physics. I made it up. <laughs> And it's based on the fact that things get rounded off all the time in computers. So there's no there's no reason not to round off your own results when you get an answer. Because because it, because still those computers are getting rounded and rounded and rounded. All these programs are rounding off to things. So you're going to end up with whole numbers. So when you don't get a whole number, you try to clean it up. So somewhere not and, and again. There's no written in stone 184. There's no written in stone 175. But that's where it worked out, right? And 184 is where we failed and gapped down. And so we're going to come back to 184, consolidate there, move up to 192 or 193, whatever. And then from 193, we're going to go back to around 202. In the middle of this line, we'll hang out between these two, we'll ping pong here until it squeezes down. And then right here, they're going to come out with earnings. And then the thing's going to go like that. They're going to go, holy crap. They're going to come out with their holiday earnings on the new iPhones that everybody thinks or some kind of disaster. And they're gonna say, hey, you know what? We never sell more phones ever. And you know what? We 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 charge 30% more than the old phones, so we never made more money than we made now. <laughs> Isn't that funny? <laughs> but you gotta wait three months for it to happen. So until then you're gonna have to just sit there and panic or whatever. Um somebody anonymous says, seems like a good time to add an Apple bull post trade. What would you recommend? So the 195 puts for 27 a share. Okay. Was it? I don't know. Let's see. Well, options opportunity portfolio. Wow. Oh, that's, yeah, that's because there's some messed up trades in here. We didn't do any of the changes and it's uh, wherever. Apple, Apple, Apple. Was it? Oh, see, like, yeah, this messed up things like BJO is all zeroed out and things like that. We gotta fix some of these. I mean, not fix it. It's a, it's the um, the way they're they the, the way this power options guys are uh, reporting at the moment. They've got a lot of things that have messed up. See, look, zero zero zero. It's all screwed up. Um, so so we have massive massive losses on things that we shouldn't have. Um, I don't know why they have some problem with their computer. All right, maybe we add to the. I, I don't think so. That it sounds wrong to me. I just, I, I maybe if I did, we did. I mean, I don't remember adding it to the OOP, but we might have sold five puts in the OOP just for the money. Um, I certainly don't have a problem with that sale. So it's just a matter of will we add a bull call spread? Maybe not, though, because the bull call spread is expensive. As we sold the puts. If we really think we've got a nice firm bottom, we might buy some. We've got, um, we have, um, then, like I said, this is wrong, but let's say we have $150,000, $160,000. That means we have three twenty dollars in buying power, and we're using ninety five, dollars so we're using a third of our buying power. Yeah, maybe we could afford it. Okay, so the point is we buy a bull call spread when we think Apple has flattened out and we feel more confident. What bull call spread would we buy if I was buying it right now? Um, and I am confident about this bottom. I mean, it could go lower. But with the OOP, I, I don't have, you know, I don't, I don't want to keep putting money into it. So I want to be absolutely sure we're really bottoming. And there's no hurry on these things. Apple. Like I said, we're not going to really, you're not going to really see a breakout for a while. Um, let's see. If we were to pick up, 
So, you know, look, I want to be around 170. So I look at the 170s and I say, well, okay, those are 37 bucks. What's it cost me to go to the 160s? Those are 42 bucks. So that's five bucks to go $10 lower. I don't mind that. Okay. Now, so 42 bucks here. How much are these guys? These guys are 48. So it's a little bit more. It's not really worth it. So I think I'm okay here, 160. Now, the question is, what if I took the 170s? So these are 42. These are 37. That we decided was a good roll. Uh, what if I went to the 180s? Those are 32. These are 37. That's four dollars. So I only save four bucks by giving up ten. I wouldn't do that. Here I make here I here for five bucks I get ten more in strike. I do like that. So therefore I like the 160s. Now, where do I get the most bang for my buck on a sale? I certainly want at least a thirty dollars spread. So I'm looking at these. What did I say the base was on the 160s it was 42. So if we're at 42 here, I certainly don't want to be lower than 20. I'd like to have at least 22 back. So what, what do I get for 22 back? Basically, you're at the two tens. That's a $50 spread for 22. That's not bad. So what if I go down here? Here, I'm going to get like 21. Here, I'm going to get like 24. I only get $3 more for giving up um, $10 in strike. That doesn't make any sense, right? That, uh, why would I do that for three bucks? So I do like the two tens in that case. Now, what if I go up to the two um, twenties? Well, now it's only I'm only going to get sixteen, seventeen dollars. So I'm giving up. Um, I'm gaining four. I'm giving up. Um, I'm gaining ten strike, but I'm giving up four bucks. And frankly, that's a big four bucks. So. And, and 210 is a pretty good target. I don't think, I mean, I, I think we'll be over 210, we can be at 250, but I'd rather be a little more conservative and $50 is a nice size spread anyway. So I think that's good. So basically the spread I would add is the 160 for 40, uh, 160 for $42. And I would sell the 210s for 20, whoop, for 21 or $22. So you're into a 20 or 21 dollar spread there and then that's going to be offset by whatever puts you decide to sell currently i would sell the 120 170 puts for 20 bucks now if you do that on an even spread the 160 210 spread and sell the 7 170 puts you're basically in a free spread for 50 dollars. you have 50 dollars upside and the worst thing that can happen to you is you have to buy apple for 170. But if you don't buy Apple and it goes to 210, then you end up making 50 bucks for doing nothing. That's that's a nice way to put. Paul says, I was in China last week. Seemed like all our guys had iPhone X's. They looked at all my so my iPhone 8. I have an iPhone X, yeah. Um, I like it. My daughter, my daughter wants the, the new big XR or whatever, the biggest one they got. And I'll see how I like that. I don't really, it's to me, I'm very happy with my phone. I have the, I had the X since the day it came out. Um, I'm very happy with it. I does everything I want. I've been all over the world with it and uh, it works fine. Does everything I want. Doesn't run out of battery. Sounds great. Uh, I think I have zero complaints. Camera's fantastic. Everything's good about it. Um, so I, I'm not big on changing phones. In fact, I, I waited. I had my six for for more than two years until I got the um, the eight. Because I was perfectly happy with my six. I thought it was a great. I had a six plus. I thought it was a, no. I, it wasn't a big six. It was like the normal six. I think it was a plus. Seven. I don't remember. Um, somehow the plus sounds like it's a big one. Um, anyway, I had a six. or some sort of six. I was perfectly happy with that. If I get a phone, I'm happy with it. I'm not like looking for the next thing every time it comes out like the seven and the eight, I was like, who cares? I'm like, hey, you know, but when the X came out, it had so much cool stuff and it was so much faster. I was like, okay, it's gonna be worth me fix switching phones. Jim Jones says, NVDA. Yes, Jim, NVDA. Go team. All right. I mean, I mean, really, is that a question? What is that? <laughs> Bitcoin, you know, killed me. what killed NVIDIA is obviously um, they, they were making a huge amount of bonus money from Bitcoin miners, and that, that's completely died. So that's very sad. All right, you can't go by these portfolios because they're all messed up. Their whole their system is messed up right now. So I don't know, I don't know how much we have in any portfolio or what's going on at the moment. I'm sure it'll work itself out. We were fine yesterday, so I assume we're still fine today. 
Wow, it's not even switching. It's totally broken. It didn't even switch the money to our portfolio. Oh, well. Sorry about that. Can't go over those. Let's see how the market's looking. Oh, we're just drifting along, and it's a holiday, so, you know, we're going to keep drifting. The volume's got to be direct. Oh, we can look at the volume. Let's take a look. Um, SPY. And we go to the historical data. Yeah, see, 44 million is, is light, and we've only got an hour left to trade. Um, so you're going to be like half of what the previous days, what the last week has been. Uh, it's into the holiday. Friday is only a half a day. So um, uh, so that's it. So happy Thanksgiving, everybody. <laughs> it's gonna be, that's it for the week, really. Um, hopefully nothing violent happens on Friday. I don't think it will. I think we'll just kind of drift along. Other countries are open, though, so something can happen. Other countries are open tomorrow. You have to be aware of that. This is a very American, unique holiday that, that only affects us. Other countries are open. And, and so if something crazy happens in other countries and the markets crash 5%, we're going to go down 5% too. We just won't be able to do anything about it until, we, until our markets reopen. So um, I'm not looking for it, though, because most of the craziness comes out of freaking Trump. You know, so if, if Trump's hopefully going to shut his mouth and eat some turkey, and that'll be that. Um, so, so, uh, you got the Brexit thing, right? There's, you know, while, while we're eating Thanksgiving dinner, they're, they're just, they're having meetings about Brexit right now. That's going to get announced one way or another. I, I think that'll probably get done and done will be released. So I think that's a, a net positive. Um, you've got, uh, the China trade is not going to obviously progress over Thanksgiving because we're not going to do anything. It's unlikely China's going to suddenly make some announcement. It's devastating. Um, the Saudi thing is what it is. I mean, Trump today is talking about what great guys the Saudis are. I mean, well, it's one thing not to like, it's one thing, I don't know. It's one thing not to do anything about it when they when they do something bad, but to start like talking them up like they're great guys. They're freaking, they're murderers. And they killed a journalist. They killed, they didn't kill a journalist. They killed an American journalist. He had, he, he was, he was a, uh, he, he was a, a Muslim, but he was an American Muslim. He was ours. He was a U.S. citizen. And they murdered him on their embassy. And we're doing nothing. And we're not just doing nothing. Trump is kissing Saudi ass. It's despicable. It's not, this is not my, this is not what I want my country to be. And this is a reflection on you. When you go to foreign countries, this is what you are to them. Where is he? Thank you, Saudi Arabia, for lowering oil prices. They didn't lower oil prices. They're having a meeting to raise oil prices. But he's trying to spin anything he can for the Saudis. And, and he knows, everybody knows that they killed him. And he's talking about how, well, they say this and he said that and who knows that, you know. And, and, and he's talking about Osama bin Laden and we should have done this and that. How about what you should have done for the Saudis where 19 of the, of the people who bombed the World Trade Center were Saudis and nothing ever happened from that either. These are his pals. Oh, this was cute. Where is it? Little Adam Shit. His name is, um, I don't know. It's like Shot or something like that. It's not Shit. His name is not Shit. And Trump, obviously, Trump knows his name's not Shit. But he names him Little Adam Shit. Hey, he's such a baby. I, it's just, I'm sorry. It's horrifying. Finish the wall. How about start the wall? How about, how about, yeah. Uh, anyway, but th this is us. This is America. This is you. You're a foreign country. He's your leader. You voted for him. And you say, I didn't vote for him. No, you voted for him. He's your, he's your president. That's your guy. He represents us. And, and when we sit there and we let him do this, and we let him kiss Saudi Arabia's ass, and you say, oh, well, that's Trump. It's not Trump. That's America. He's saying that America thinks this is okay. And, and you have to do something to say you don't think it's okay. 
You don't sit there. And the fact that you let him sit there and say that kind of crap without saying anything, without raising your voices, without writing to people, without demanding action, that's you saying it's okay too. I've never, I, I'm mortified at what's going on right now with the Saudi situation. But anyway, so be thankful for whatever, but I, I'm sure not thankful for this. <laughs> So anyway, we'll do this again uh, back in the back in the saddle next week. Everybody have a wonderful holiday. Oh wait, somebody's saying something. Um, let's see. Thank you for the apple spread process. Could you discuss your hesitancy adding to the OOP? It's expensive, and and it's probably, it may have to get rolled. I'm like, it's it's it's. It's not necessarily the right time to put it in. In a week or two, when I feel comfortable that it's done going down, yeah, I'll feel better about it. But, you know, the OOP isn't like the LTP. We don't have a ton of margin that we can sell short calls and whatever. You know, the LTP, I, I know that I can fix it, and I always want Apple, and if it goes lower, we'll put more money into it. And if it goes lower, we'll sell some calls, and we'll put more money in. And if the calls go against us, we'll double it down. And if it turns into a $250,000 position, who cares in the LTP? But in the OOP, I don't have that kind of I don't have that kind of room. So it's not I don't want to get too involved in it until I'm absolutely sure we've really got a solid bottom here. And to have a solid bottom on Apple, I have to feel the market's got a solid bottom, and I don't feel that way at all. If the market goes down another ten percent, uh, if the Nasdaq goes down another ten percent, that if it goes back twenty percent to five thousand, Apple could easily go down 10, 20 percent, and that's that's the uh, one forty. At 140, I would sell my freaking house and buy Apple, but but that's 140. At 170, if I jump into the LT into the OOP now and we took a position, and even if we did five, and we do five twenty spreads, that's ten thousand dollars already committed to one position for five twenty dollars spreads. And then if we have to roll it, that's another five thousand we're putting into it in a, in a small portfolio. And if we have to roll it again, it's another five thousand dollars we're putting into it in a small portfolio. It's it's not right. It's a, you know you don't you don't play expensive stocks in a small portfolio unless you think they're rock solid. So we sold the puts because you know the puts can be rolled over time. We're never really going to get assigned them, and the risk is not that high. Even if it goes thirty dollars against us, it's still going to be fifteen thousand dollar loss that we're going to roll, and we'll never actually pay the fifteen thousand dollars. But if we have a short term put uh, spread. Short term meaning two years short term. If we because we can roll for 10 years. If we have a short term spread for two years, it expires at a certain point and the money is lost. And then you've got to put more money into it. And it's disproportionate to the portfolio to take that kind of risk. Uh, the calculation example of Apple was for, was 20%. How does this compare to the 5% rule? The 5% rule includes. That, that's part of the 5% rule. It's called the 5% rule because a lot of things are based on 5%. It doesn't mean every single thing that happens is 5%. So anyways, go to our educational section. You'll see a lot of uh, this, several articles on the 5% rule. Um, LT looks like it might be okay for a longer play. I don't know, does it? They hit it wrong. What is LT? Let's see. No, I'm not sure what you mean by LT. LMT? Did you mean Lockheed Martin? Shift. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, kissing Iran's ass is bad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how about kissing North Korea's ass? That's fun, too. Um, All right, well, thanks for all the Thanksgiving wishes. A lot of people said happy Thanksgiving and so on and so forth. Um, Jim Jones, you said something about LT. I think you meant LMT. I do like LMT long term. Um, I'm not sure if you mean LB, LMT, but LMT. You know, now that they're actually selling those F-35s, Lockheed Martin's a good thing. Plus, I love Lockheed Martin long term because they are they are actually the closest company to uh, having having commercial fusion, and and somebody 
is going to be a, a much bigger company than Apple when they have, they're going to be a multi-trillion dollar company, the one that has really nails down fusion. It's going to be the biggest thing ever. So I do like this. Oh, oh, I see what's happening. It's not the gallery view. Gallery. L-M-T. So I like Lockheed. They're not particularly cheap, but at least they're not 350 anymore. But I, I would like them better if they came back down to 250. I'd love them. Yeah, I, I would have done that. If I had caught that spike, I would have gone in because I really do like them. I, long term, I think they're going to be a gold mine. I mean, really, the F-35 problems were holding them back for years. So now they're, they're coming, coming into their own a little bit. And Jim says LMT. Yeah, LMT. But they're, you know, they're a very solid company now. They are possibly within five years of having commercial fusion. And, and, and maybe somebody will beat them to it. But Lockheed Martin seriously on track for commercial fusion reactors. Going to change the world. So it may save the world. That may that commercial fusion may save the entire planet. Clean, unlimited energy, very low cost will fix so many of the world's problems. Uh, it's like it suddenly puts us like into that like utopian science fiction future sort of thing. Of course, if people aren't greedy and wall it off and keep it to themselves or, or dole it out at high prices and so on and so forth. But, you know, <laughs> in other words, if humans, if hopefully robots will take over the planet before then and they will distribute the energy free and, and evenly to all the people instead of like humans being involved. If humans are involved, they could crap it up. But they, they, it's, it's, you know, it's really everything you dream about in science fiction is, is in fusion. The promise is there. So it would be really wonderful if they can solve that problem. It'll, it'll make the world a much better place. And a lot of people are working on it, and, and I think it's going to happen. I think the science is there. It makes sense. They know what they're doing. Um, they, can create, they can create a fusion reaction. They just can't sustain it for a reasonable amount of time at a reasonable price is the problem. It's got to be sustainable without being too economically unreasonable. But there's, they're really mostly just things that should be solvable. You know, that's how science works. It's, it's, a, it's funny because you can invent something and have the chart for it and all blueprints, but you have to hammer it out and the hammering it out takes hundreds of scientists all doing their little parts for years and years and years and refining 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 until you finally have a product that's good enough which is how we made the atomic bomb einstein had a theory that this would work uh they tested it conceptually and they had to work and work and work and work and work until they got a model that actually did what was theorized that's where we are with fusion we're working 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 to build a model that does what's theorized but it's going to happen. It will happen. We just have to survive. The species has to survive long enough to, to benefit from it. That's all. Anyway, so on that note, be thankful that somebody somewhere is trying to do something positive for the world. And we will get back together next Wednesday and see, uh, see what happens. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a good day. Happy Thanksgiving.